I originally agreed to speak today as a way to give my father some rest, um, but also hope to share with you some encouragement and maybe some new perspective today as well. So, happy Father's Day, everyone. It is a happy Father's Day indeed. That's right, yeah, you can give it up. Yeah, that's all good. So we thought, you know, this year, instead of setting up a cutesy little photo booth outside, we could just have fathers climb in amongst the construction site and do some manly poses today. That's right. <laughs> but we do appreciate you all bearing with us during this time of renovations throughout the church. We appreciate our many volunteers who have helped to clear out different rooms, who have helped to get this stage ready, and who, um, you know, <laughs> reassembled our whole sound setup as well. We are very appreciative of all the help that we have here, so thank you all. Amen. <laughs> So um, it is Father's Day today. Um, I found that in my preparation for today that this is the 112th Father's Day that we're celebrating um, in this country. The first was celebrated um, back in 1910 in Spokane, Washington, actually is where it started, by the way, um, in case you didn't know. But um, before I jump into uh, the word today, I wanted to explore a little bit about why we celebrate. Why do we celebrate Father's Day? Um, like I said, it, it has a long history in this state, at least. Um, but why do we celebrate? Why do we celebrate Father's Day? Are fathers something worth celebrating? Are fathers necessary? That may seem like a silly question to you. It's okay, you can laugh um, to many of you, but it's not so silly of a question, really. Um, this is a piece from The Atlantic back in 2010 entitled, entitled, Our Fathers Necessary? A Paternal Contribution May Not Be As Essential As We Think. Um, you can go to the next slide. This comes from a New York Times discussion in 2013 entitled, What Are Fathers For? One of the contributors here, Hannah Rosen, an editor of New York Magazine, opened her piece by saying, I'm not sure children need their fathers. And then finally, the next slide is a piece from HuffPost back from 2014 entitled, Fathers Are Not Needed. <laughs> so um, I know that we can uh, often surround ourselves with people who uh, think similarly to the way we do, and so you may value fathers very much in the role that they play, but um, our society may not. And so I just want to explore some of that today. But um, regardless of what society may say, we're, let's look at what we see in society, what the results are, what society shows. I found that in my research preparing for today that Children who grow up without fathers present in the home with them are five times more likely to end up in poverty or to commit crimes. They are nine times more likely to drop out of school. And they are 20 times, that's fingers and toes, 20 times more likely to end up in prison. Um, from the Journal of Research on Adolescents, after controlling for income, Kids without fathers are more likely to end up in prison, and kids who never had fathers in the home with them are the most likely of any people in society to end up in prison. Over the years, the percentage of children raised in single-parent homes has significantly increased, even just looking back at the past 50 years. Let's go to the first graph there, John. So these are... Um, Numbers. I simplified the graphs, but these are numbers from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. So this is a percentage of children with unwed parents over the years. So look, this first bar is in 1960. This is the overall average of all kids in the U.S. That number is 5%. Goes up to about 18% in 1980. In 2000, sitting about 32%. And in 2015, sitting at 41%. So this is an overall average of children with unwed parents. Okay, let's go to the next graph, please. Last graph, I promise. 
Um, this is uh, the same data, but broken up by race. So blue line again is 1965 there, percentage of out of wedlock births. And the orange line is in 2015. So um, children who are identified as white there in 1965 was about 5%. In 2015, about 25%. White children grew up unwed or were born out of wedlock. Hispanic numbers were about 22 and 52. And then black children, 25 and 73. So this is a problem we face in our society. Um, if you'll go back to that last graph real quick, I want you to think about, you don't have to answer, but about the time when you grew up. Think about back to the time when you grew up, maybe you had, and the people that were in your home. And I want, I just put these up here so that you may realize that the time you grew up in may be very different from the time that kids grow up in now. Um, that's really what I want to drive home with this, is that, um, you know, it may be common sense to you of the role that fathers play. Um, maybe you had good fathers or good father figures in your life who were very valuable to you, but that is becoming increasingly rare. You see that number is almost to the halfway point there. These numbers are from seven years ago too. So um, I think despite what society may say, you know, questioning our fathers necessary, I think um, it's evident that there is a problem here. And it's evident by some of those statistics that I read that fathers do serve some role. And that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about today. So if fathers are, oh, and I do want to real quick say that I think there are many situations out there where it may be beyond the other household member's control, whether or not a father stays in the home, Right? difficult situations out there, and there are some, um, you know, like superhero moms out there that are awesome and do amazing. Um, nonetheless, I think this is a problem that we face, and it's something that we need to be aware of. Even when you talk to people that may be younger than you, uh, co-workers or friends, right, understand some of where they're coming from. So, Despite what may be said or be written in articles, I think that we do face a problem and that fathers do serve some crucial role. So then we come to the question, what is a father, right? What is, or maybe more importantly, what is a good father, right? What is the role that fathers ought to serve? What is it that our society is missing? You can just go to the title slide. Um, so when we look at society's image of fathers, you know, where do we look? What do we see? Are we looking at our television shows and those often sort of goofy dads who don't really know what's going on? Or, you know, do we look at athletes, you know? Maybe hit or miss right there. There are some good fathers out there. LeBron James has raised some kids. There are some good players. I saw some really good uh, stories of fatherhood. Um, from players on the Rams team. Did you know one of the Rams players left immediately after the Super Bowl because his wife was giving birth? Made it just in time. Um, but, you know, how, I want you to think, how are fathers represented in our society? You know, are there good examples we have to look towards? Um, and I think what we've learned, even from social, psychological sort of research as to the role of fathers is that, at the very least, they provide an example for boys and girls in the home. For boys, they provide an example of control, especially relating to the areas of sex and violence. As I already said, those, who, those young boys who grew up without a father are much more likely to go to prison for violent crimes. That fact on its own demonstrating that even though they may have great single moms in the home, they still face a problem, right? They still face an inclination. Um, and for girls, their father is the man that they relate to, right? How should I be treated by a man, right? How should a, how should a man treat her? And it's been shown that girls who grow up without fathers are more likely to be sexually promiscuous at an earlier age or sexually active at an earlier age. 
So we're going to explore the image of biblical fathers today. I just wanted to open up and give you that background as to the situation that people face. All right. All right. All right. So um, <laughs> turning our, our, our eyes to the Bible and some of the images that it has of fathers, there are the good, the bad, and everywhere in between, right? Even a casual reading of the Bible may show you that. Um, and so uh, this is not an in-depth, uh, multi-week Bible study on fatherhood, but we're just going to touch on a few points today. Um, we're going to center our discussion today on the story of Abraham and Isaac, right? So Abraham, right, is the father of faith. His story begins at the beginning of the Bible in Genesis, um, right after that long genealogy that you often skip over, right after the flood, right? Um, <laughs> right? You have the, the flood of the whole world, Noah's Ark, um, the saving of his family and all the animals, a long genealogy, and then it opens up with the story of Abraham, or Abram, as he is then called. So we open up with Abram, and life's going pretty well. He's living with his um, father. He is married. He has a nephew. His father is pretty wealthy. They're living in a land um, called Haran, right? They had moved out of um, the land of the Chaldeans or the land of the Babylonians, into Haran and settled there. When we open on this story, Abram is 75 years old, and this is the beginning of his story. So, um, let's see. So I'm going to turn to Genesis 12. Just going to read a little bit here. So, um, right in Genesis 12, we have the Lord calling out to Abram, saying, Go out from your land, your relatives, and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So, we open on this story, and Abram is in a pretty comfortable place. He is with his family in his father's land, father pretty wealthy. Um, you might even say he's lived a full life, 75 years old by that point, has a nephew and a wife that he loves. But God calls to him, and he calls him out of his comfort zone, out of the land of his fathers into the unknown, into a new land, and he makes a covenant or a promise with him, saying that he was going to expand his family, make it great, and bless the whole world through his family. So Abram, very important character. Um, but as you know, Abram at that time did not have any children of his own. As I said, he was 75 years old already. So Abram starts thinking to himself, well, the clock is ticking. He said these things are going to happen. And ultimately, Abraham fails and he does not trust God to provide um, a way for his promise to come true. He sees what's in front of him. He sees the challenges, um, the very real challenges that he is facing, the barriers between him and what he knows God has said is going to happen. And he has an opportunity, right? He has an opportunity to either um, trust that what God says is going to happen is going to happen, or to go his own way, to, to you know, take the, take the means into his own hands and make it happen for himself. And so um, his wife convinces him, you know, I think it was a joint decision to have um, a child with his servant girl, right? He has the child Ishmael. Ishmael grows up with him. Um, but He's failed, right? He's broken his trust with God, the promise that um, God made with him. But God is faithful and provides another chance. So, you know, about 12, 13 years later, where when Abram is closer to 100 than 75, God comes to Ab Abram and Sarah and he says, I'm going to give you a son. This is not the fulfillment of my promise. When you took 
um, took things into your own hands and your own means instead of trusting me, that is not how I'm going to fulfill my promise. But I'm going to give you another chance. And he does. And Abraham and Sarah have another son named Isaac. And Isaac becomes the one who the Israelites trace their lineage through, right? Where um, Paul and others in the New Testament write that we trace our promise through, right? Is your son shall be called Isaac, not Ishmael. God is graceful and provides for Ishmael, but he is also faithful to his promise. Just because Abram thought he knew what was best did not mean God's plans were derailed. So this is where we're opening our discussion today. Um, Abraham and Isaac. Isaac is uh, a young man, I think around 12 or 13, around this time, okay? And God is going to come to Ab- Abram again, now with the name of Abraham. So we're going to open to Genesis 22. Jump in ahead. All right, so chapter 22. I'm going to read through this sort of fast, but... Here we go. It says this, After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, here I am, he answered. Take your son, he said, your only son Isaac, whom you love, go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. So Abraham got up early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took with him two of his young men and his son Isaac. He split wood for a burnt offering and set out to go to the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there to worship, then we'll come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. In his hand, he took the fire and the knife, and the two of them walked on together. Then Isaac spoke to his father, Abraham and said, my father. And he replied, here I am, my son. Isaac said, well, the fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Isaac knew something was up. Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Then the two of them walked on together. When they arrived at the place that God had told him about, Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood. He bound his son Isaac and placed him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called on him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He replied, here I am. Then he said, do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your only son from me. Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it as a burnt offering in place of his son. And Abraham named the place the Lord will provide. So today it is said, it will be provided on the Lord's mountain. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn this is the Lord's declaration. Because you have done this thing and not withheld your only son, I will indeed bless you and make your offspring as numerous as the stars of the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your offspring will possess the city gates of their enemies and all the nations of the earth will be blessed by your offspring because you have obeyed my command. Right? So this is um, an essential story in our faith, but often a confusing one to people, right? Right? There's a lot going on here. So let's jump in. So, God calls to Abraham, and it specifically says that God is testing Abraham with this. So again, he's calling out to Abraham, seeing if Abraham is going to respond to his call. On the third day, the third day, he ascends the mountain to sacrifice his son. That third day becomes a paradigm for testing in the Bible. And Abraham obeys, right? As opposed to um, what we just read about, um, when Abraham failed the test, not the only time he failed, but when he failed the test and took things into his own hands, said, I know better, and had a son Ishmael, this time he's responding differently. He obeys. I just want you, you know, let that request resonate 
with you for a moment. You know, what is it that he is asking? Asking him to sacrifice his only son. Asking him to lay down, you know, the only way that Abraham sees in front of him that God's promises are going to come true is through this son. This son who he's waited over a hundred years for. This one and only son. This son who specifically was um, deemed the heir. God is now calling for Abraham to lay him down. And yet he obeys. And because he's faithful, God provides a substitute, right? God does not allow this to pass. There's no point in the Bible where our God, where Yahweh condones child sacrifice, even though people may misconstrue this story, right? Um, Abraham passed the test and God affirms his covenant with him. He affirms his promise. But what do we learn from this story? Was Abraham a good father in this story? Was he a good father to bind his son, to carry him up the mountain, to raise the knife above him? Was he a good father? He is later referred to as the father of our faith, as the patriarch of our faith, right? So I'm going to take a step back real quick, and I want to explore this theme. Um, you can just put it on the title slide, John. Um, I want to explore this theme that we're introduced to through this story of testing, right? God tested Abraham. God tested Abraham. Well, what is a test? I don't know about you, but I've taken many tests in my lifetime. Um, I think they are unavoidable, especially in our society, right? You got to take a test to do everything. Got to take tests to get through school before you can drive a car. Hopefully, before you drive anything bigger than a car, <laughs> you're taking some sort of test, right? Um, all sorts of tests. You may have to take aptitude tests or whatnot for work. You may have to submit bodily fluids for tests. I don't know. So we all are faced with some sort of test. So what is um, it referring to here when we're talking about testing? Testing. Um, I remember, as a fun side note, when I started medical school, we had our first test coming up. Um, everyone was really nervous for it, didn't really know if we had studied too much or not enough. You know, it was all really dependent on this test, didn't have any feedback yet as to how we were doing. Um, but anyway, so we took this test. Um, we were all really nervous about it. We come out, and the upperclassmen had made a little um, presentation for us outside with some brownies, and they had a big poster. It said, congrats, one test down, 173 more to go. <laughs> and I thought they were joking at the time. <laughs> they were not. So... I've taken many tests um, of that sort anyways. There are many, many, many types. So, um, but we're talking about testing. So in the Bible, when um, it speaks about God testing his people, what is meant here, right? Is this an obstacle that's put in our way? You know, is this like a banana peel thrown in front of our path? Or is this an opportunity, is this an opportunity? So I want you to think about this. If someone has your good in mind, right, the best of intentions and the good in mind for you, if they place a test in front of you, then it is meant as an opportunity to demonstrate your ability and your faithfulness to them, right? Right? When, you know, if... Uh, uh, young parents are encouraging their child to, you know, put their shoes on by themselves. You could call that a test of themselves. You know, you're, if you're refusing to help, to see if they can do it on their own, you do not have nefarious objects in mind. You're not just trying to torture that toddler, right? Um, but you're trying to demonstrate to them and have them demonstrate to you that they can do this, you know? You know, you've been putting those shoes on their feet for years, and now it's their turn, right? Whether it's um, 
tying shoes, getting dressed by themselves, uh, using the restroom on their own, <laughs> um, whatever it may be, right? Um, when a loving parent places those sorts of tests in front of their child, they are not done with any nefarious object. But if someone has your destruction in mind, if someone does have nefarious plots and schemes, then that test is an obstacle. It is um, a distraction. It is a temptation. It is an attempt to lead you down the wrong path, right? If they're trying to get you out of the way or they don't want you doing well or they want to feel better about themselves. And so we are introduced to this um, theme of testing in the beginning of the Bible, right? The Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve are there. They are created in a good and perfect world. They are able to eat of any tree in the garden, even the tree of life, all except for one. There is not a lack of trees in the garden. There is one that they were instructed not to eat of. It was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? Um, and ultimately, the serpent comes, uh, convinces Eve and Adam to eat of the fruit, to break their covenant with God. And this is the first test that humanity faced, and they failed, right? But when you think about um, the intentions of the people who set up this test, right, when God put uh, well, I guess we are coming into disputed territory here, but I believe that when God put the um, tree into the garden, it was not to cause Adam and Eve to fail, right? It was an opportunity for them to demonstrate their commitment to God, to demonstrate their obedience to God, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I think about it like riding a bike, you know, can you really ride a bike if you always have the training wheels on? Is that, do you really know how to ride a bike? You know, are you really going to know until you take them off? Just a metaphor, just a metaphor. Don't throw, don't get mad at me. Theolo anyway, um, my theology is intact. Um, but Adam and Eve had a choice between trusting in God's wisdom or trusting in their own wisdom, right? Literally, their own knowledge of good and evil, right? Were they going to trust in what God was said was good? He looked out over the world and said, this is very good. Were they going to eat of the good trees or were they going to eat of the one tree that God said, no, this one is not for you. This one is not good for you. So were they going to trust what God was said was good and bad or were they going to define good and evil for themselves? And that's exactly what they did there. And jump ahead um, a few chapters to their children, Cain and Abel, after they've been cast out of the garden, right? So Cain and Abel are offering sacrifices to God, and for whatever reason, um, we don't know exactly why, but Cain's is not um, accepted in the sight of the Lord. And he becomes um, angry over this. He becomes jealous because his brothers are accepted, but his are not right? And he gives in to hatred. I'm going to turn to Genesis chapter 4. Um, he gives in to hatred and jealousy of his brother. I'm going to jump to chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. It says this, then the Lord said to Cain, why are you furious? Why do you look despondent? If you do what is right, won't you be accepted? But if you don't do what is right, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it, right? Again, we see humanity faces a choice here. Before Cain does anything, God comes and he tells him, you're at a crossroads here. Sin is crouching at your door. Right? It's trying to lead you down one path, but you can conquer it. You can resist it. And we know that Cain does not, that he murders his brother Abel, that he defines good and evil for himself. Instead of ruling over sin, he allows sin to rule over him. And so that's all what we have going on in the background when we pick up with Abraham and Isaac later on in Genesis. 
right? So Abraham is facing a test, right? I believe just as in those past times that God, Yahweh, has the best of intentions in mind. He is not trying to ruin Abraham's life. He is not trying to kill Abraham's son. But he has a choice, right? Is he going to trust in what God says is good and God's command? Or is he going to define good and evil for himself as he did before? So um, this theme is all throughout the Bible, of course. There are so many stories I could pick up with this. Um, Just one more that I do want to touch on is later in the book of Daniel, right? Uh, Daniel chapter 3. This is when... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego um, are in Babylonian exile. The um, Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar has erected a giant statue and commanded that when the music plays, everyone needs to bow down and worship this statue of him. These three um, Hebrew or Israelite men refuse, saying we've been commanded not to bow down to any statue, right? Not to worship any god except our God, Yahweh. And now they're faced with the threat of being thrown into an oven, being thrown into a giant fiery furnace, right? And if this sets off any bells in your head, right, you'd be thinking about another time when Israel was faced with the test of were they gonna worship God or were they gonna worship a golden statue, right? That should be in the back of your head as well. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to give you an answer to this question if you're going to bow down to me. If the God we serve exists, then he can rescue us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he can rescue us from the power of you, the king. But even if, but even if he does not rescue us, we want you as king to know that we will not serve your gods or worship the gold statue you set up. Even if, even if he exists, no matter what happens, they knew the path that they were going to take. They knew, they knew, even if the God we serve exists, even if. And we know that when they were thrown into the furnace, they were not burned alive, not even the clothes or the hair on them were singed, right? They were safeguarded, they were delivered, and they came out in perfect health, right? There was another one in the fire with them. So um, I could go on, you know, I could talk about the prophets of the Old Testament, the disciples and apostles in the New, Paul, so many times, right? (laughs) Being um, blinded for several days, thrown off his donkey on the road, Uh, being imprisoned once, twice, a million times, being shipwrecked, being bitten by a snake, so many times. Um, But this theme of testing is very important. It is something that should resonate with you and I because, like I said, we all face tests in our life. Are we going to trust in what God has said is good or are we going to decide for ourselves what the right way is, you know? We know what God has commanded us to do. Are we going to be obedient to that call like Abraham was, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were, like so many were, right? So testing in the Bible ultimately reflects a choice between living by our wisdom or God's, a choice between letting our sin rule over us or ruling over our sin, we learned with Cain. And a choice between partnering with God to bear his image in the world as Adam and Eve were tasked to do or going our own way. So today is Father's Day. So I do want to emphasize how this applies to fathers. And now, John, you can go to that last slide there. So fathers, what should we learn from all of this? Should we learn that we need to bind up our children? No, (laughs) hopefully not. Uh, You're supposed to laugh. So, um, (laughs) fathers, I think what, yeah, yeah, what we are meant to learn is this, is that good fathers, fathers who pass 
the test are the ones that yield to God. Abraham was willing to lay down everything, to lay down his future, to lay down his legacy, to lay down his promises, to lay down the son that he loved and waited so long for. He was willing to lay that all down because God said to him. He trusted in God's goodness and God's wisdom, even if it didn't make sense to him, right? I think that's one thing we often get stuck on, right, is like when we are called to do something or called to obey what we've already been told to do, right? Well, you know, how am I going to do that? How is that going to work out in my life? I don't see how I can do that without losing everything. I don't see how I can tithe without, you know, and still make my payments. I don't see how I can tell my coworkers about Jesus and still be respected in the office. I don't see how I can reach out to other people when I can barely take care of myself. But We are never promised that everything is going to make sense to us, right? So many times, so many times in the New Testament, Jesus is explaining things to his disciples, right? Seems obvious to us knowing the story of like, okay, I'm going to go here. People are going to do these things to me. And they're like, what are you talking about? What do you mean? Or right after Jesus um, shares a parable, they'll come to him right after and be like, what were you talking about? What does any of that mean, (laughs) you know? Um, Oftentimes, God's plan is not going to make sense to us. We are never promised it will. We have the story of the Bible to reveal the character of God to us and to encourage us that we can trust in him even when it doesn't make sense. Right? So, good fathers will yield to God, to his commands, to his plan. Good fathers will carry his name. The task of Adam and Eve was to carry the image of God in the world. That is our job today, right? Um, It is repeatedly reaffirmed in the Bible. Um, I often think of the um, passage in 2 Corinthians where Paul says that we are ambassadors of Christ to the world, right? When people look at you, They will see Christ. You are representing Christ to them for better or for worse is up to you, right? But if they know that you're a Christian or you call yourself one, you are representing Christ to them. If they don't know that you are a Christian, then it may be time to start representing Christ to them. So good fathers carry the name of Jesus. I also want to point out in um, Exodus at um, the mountain, uh, Mount Sinai, when God gives his uh, you know, famous Ten Commandments to Israel, you may or may not recall the third commandment, right? Which is, do not, you know, do not take the Lord's name in vain. Do not misuse the name of the Lord your God. And often um, that is interpreted in a very narrow sense in Um, English in our understanding, right? You have these first two commandments, you know, have no other gods before me. Do not make any images of anything you see and worship that instead of me. Don't misuse my name. And then keeps moving on, right? But when we look at the Hebrew for that word, I did not pronounce the Hebrew word because I can't pronounce it well, but um, I believe it is, I agree with other commentators that believe it is to be interpreted more broadly. Not just do not misuse the name of the Lord your God, but to bear his name. But to represent his name to the world. Right? So you, and we know that Israel specifically was tasked with that job. That was the job of the nation of Israel was to represent God to the nations harkens back to the promise to Abraham that he was going to bless all nations through them. And it's echoed again in the third commandment to bear the name of God, to represent the name of God to the nations. And then Paul echoes it again um, in reference to Christ. So I believe that good fathers will carry the name, carry the image of Father God and reveal it to others, to your children, to your wives, to 
through your community, right? That you will act as Christ would, that you would act as God has commanded us to act, right? And then finally, I believe good fathers pass the test in front of them, right? Do not define good and evil for themselves, but trust in God's um, wisdom and what he has said is good and just and how we should act. And as I said, we all face tests in life. Not only fathers, I emphasize that today, but not only fathers, but all of us are called to pass the tests that we face in our lives. Whether that's, you know, trusting in God to provide for you, to provide your daily bread, right? To provide a way forward. It's really no different than how Abraham trusted in God to provide a way forward. We are all called to trust in God, to trust in God to help us, to um, empower us, to give us the words and the giftings that we need to serve him and to improve the lives of the people around us. We are all ambassadors of Christ. Fathers, I believe that fathers, mothers, children do have specific roles and duties and gifts as Thessalonians um, line, uh, outlines. I believe, as I said, we face a problem in this country, in our society, where many people do not have that person to look to and to see Christ through. So we are called to fill the gap. We are called to be good fathers, mothers, friends, brothers, and sisters to everyone around us. We are all ambassadors of Christ. Um, you know, our, it's not just fathers that are devalued, but the whole concept of the nuclear family, right, of the mother, father, and children, try not to go off too far, but um, today is one of the days that we get to stand together and reaffirm that, that we get to reaffirm that we value the role that God has given us as fathers, mothers, as children, as family members in the house of God. Okay, so will you respond as Abraham did? Will you respond as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did? Will you respond as so many responded to the call of God in your life? And I'm not talking about, you know, something, you know, a great grandiose gesture, you know, but I'm asking Every day in your life, will you actively look for ways to be an ambassador of God? This is the same thing we've been challenging the kids and youth with as well, not just you. Um, okay. So that's what I want you to dwell on today. How are you representing the name of God to the people around you? If the people around you do not recognize Christ in you when they look at your life, something is wrong. If you need more learning or tools or encouragement or uh, mentors or friends to help you, that is why we gather together here. And that is how we can equip you. But ultimately, the work of the church falls to each one of us when we leave this building, not when we come in. So I am going to move into a time of prayer. I thank you so much for your attention today. Um, And I want to do this in a specific way, since this is Father's Day. Um, In a few minutes, when I begin, first I'm going to start by praying for all of our fathers and those who have acted as fathers, those father figures, whether it's grandchildren or simple mentorship, nieces, nephews, kids on the block, whatever it may be. From there, I'm going to move into a time of prayer for our lost family members, for the people you know who do not have a good father or who do not have that person in their life to represent Christ to them. I know many of you have people in your families that although were raised well, have walked away from the faith. And that's something we need to fight against. That's something we can encourage each other about. This is how we can come together 
and bear each other's burdens in the church. Okay. And then, um, <laughs> um, after our time of prayer, I'm going to lay out some markers here since we do have this opportunity. Um, as we end the service, as you right before you leave, I'll invite you to um, grab a marker and find a place, an exposed place on the stage where you can write down your favorite memory verse or some words of encouragement. But I want you to take it as a sign that you are committing to act as a foundation in your family, in your community, and in this church. I don't want you to take it lightly. I know many of you have been so good in this church, and I just want to give you this opportunity to renew that covenant, to renew that commitment. Okay. So um, I'm going to spread out these markers, and then I'm going to begin praying. Um, I'm going to leave it to you where you pray. If you come up to the front, if you join hands or find people with pray, to pray with, I believe we all have our big boy and big girl pants on that you can find people or come forward to this stage if the Spirit calls you to do that. <laughs> um, this is the time to step up. This is the time to pass the test. So we're going to pray. And I encourage you, you know, that when you leave this building is when your real work begins. Okay. Join me in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you that we can gather together, um, that we can bind our faith together, Lord, and that we can bear each other's burdens. I know so many people here facing so many challenges in their lives with their coworkers, um, with Providence, with um, their family members and friends, Lord, with sickness, with so many things. And I ask that you would help, Holy Spirit, that you would fill this place and fill each of them, that they may be equipped, Lord, to act as you would in this world, to, um, to encourage each other, to lift each other up. I thank you for so many of the great fathers, mentors, and father figures that we have gathered here together. Um, I just thank you for the pillars of faith that we have in this church. I ask that you would continue to encourage them, that you would renew your covenant with them, Father, that you would encourage them that even if they have family members or people they know who are lost, that the fight is not over, Lord, but that you are continuing to work in their lives. They may not see how things are going to work out, you may not understand how if they keep going, your plan is going to happen. But we trust that you are a good God, that you are faithful to your promises. Great is your faithfulness, Lord. We believe that. We ask that you would help us to be faithful, Lord, that we would be faithful in bearing your image to this world and actively looking for ways that we can reach out to the people around us, Lord, that we can share your image in this world. I'm going to invite you to stand as the worship team comes up.